So I think we're ready to begin with a two minute introduction from each candidate. I will start with Chloe Brown. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chloe Brown. I'm a policy analyst at Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly known as Ryerson, where I work with students to find post-secondary education, employment, and training opportunities. I am running to be your mayor because over the past decade, I have worked my way up from being an intern at City Hall to becoming a policy analyst that I am today, and still nothing is working for the working class. We have given countless the politicians from across the spectrum, whether they're left wing or right wing, countless opportunities to use our investments, our pensions, our union dues to build in our name and we have nothing to show for it. It is time that we have leaders that come in all shapes and size, abilities, and it's time that these people are us. We live in these neighborhoods and we know what needs to be done. It is time for us to have the funding, resources, and infrastructure to carry out the future that we know needs to happen. It is time for communities to be at the table with more than just an empty plate. It is time for you to have a piece of the meal that is being created by your labor. So I am asking you to vote for me because we are at a time where working class needers need to be elevated. That will not happen by continuing to give your power to the establishment. So vote for me if you're looking for a candidate that is going to give you the reins to decide your own future instead of waiting around for your future to be given to you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. First, I'd like to thank the uh, Coalition of Black Train Unionists, uh, Operation Black Vote, for this opportunity. There's a number of other candidates that are in the audience, and I just want to acknowledge Claudette uh, Beals, who is here, Regis uh, Paquette's mom, who, uh, who is a candidate as well. I just want to acknowledge you, ma'am, and your courage for putting your name on the ballot after such a, a tragedy. Um, this is a historic moment for all of us to see the caliber of candidates that are on this stage is actually incredible. It gives me goosebumps to be here and to see this and to know that all of you have options to choose anyone who's here, any one of the candidates that are on the ballot to be your next mayor. So I, I don't take that lightly. Uh, of, of course, most of you know I'm a former member of Paul, Parliament, Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister. I'm also a mom, an entrepreneur, a community member, and the, plat the foundation of my platform is really about driving new revenues into Toronto. Toronto. Toronto is facing unprecedented financial crisis. And at, a, at this time, we need to ensure that there's sustainable, predictable funding earmarked for things like social assistance and social housing, or else we're going to be talking about this for a very long time. At the intersection of a pandemic, of geopolitical issues that continue to bring uh, refugees to our shores, at climate change, there are going to be people that look like us. And we will be left behind unless we have someone who has the, the wherewithal and the political will to drive the finances that are required for this city in order for us not to survive, but to thrive here. Thank you. Thank you. And next we will have Olivia Chow. Thank you to uh, the organizer, Velma, Yolanda, and the team from Operation Black Votes and all the uh, supporting uh, organization. Uh, my learning uh, when I became a school trustee, and there was a student called Fishroy Anderson, he's now called AJ, and he said to me, hey, I am doing really well in school, I want to get to university, but how is it that I'm in a level that won't let me do that? I said, well, this is totally not fair, it's pure discrimination. And we started pushing for the de-streaming of secondary schools because a lot of young people are being pushed into a different stream. Together we create, uh, with, these, with black students, created the first de-stream secondary school called Rosedale Heights Secondary School. And we were able to get the uh, provincial government of the time, talking about the 80s, to really pay attention to this issue. That's critically important. And through later on, when I was a, a city councillor, I met up with Charles Roach, uh, Dudley Laws, and Sharona Hall, all talking about police accountability. 
there is so much we can do together and we will be um, exploring that later on uh, through the evening. But I think what is most important is listening. It's about listening, it's about learning, it's about taking action together. Because we need to build a city where everyone belongs. We need a new approach at City Hall that put the focus on coordination, accountability, community investment, leadership, and yes, hope. That is critical. So let's explore more funding to anti-black racism work, um, local community more, more power, being a real partner in social procurement. Let's do all of that. And I hope to do so with you uh, as, uh, as your mayor. Thank you. All right, just go ahead. Excellent. Well, I'm going to stand because I believe you deserve uh, to hear me and see me and, and, and understand exactly what I'm, what I'm about to say. My name is Rob Davis. I'm a former Toronto City Councillor, former Vice Chairman of the Toronto Transit Commission. I was the first black City Councillor elected to the former City of York in 1991. I was the first black City Councillor elected to the amalgamated City of Toronto. And you're thinking, 1991? That's right. I was 26 years old when I registered to run. I wasn't supposed to win, but I did. And I'm not supposed to be here today, but I am. We are. And so throughout my time as a, an advocate for the community and as an elected official, I did many things that you may not realize that I had a hand in. I was there at the founding of Operation Black Vote. In fact, I gave it its name. I'm a former board member of the Black Business and Professional Association and helped organize the Harry Jerome Awards many, many years ago. Some of you, uh, and I see the president smiling from BBPA, uh, some of you uh, may have even enjoyed a patty in Little Jamaica, where I founded the Junior Carnival Parade in 1994, which has since moved to another location. So I've done a lot of things within our community, but I've also done a lot of things that have impacted the greater community. In 2000, I introduced Canada's very first gun buyback program, which over the last 23 years has netted 10,000 guns from the streets of Toronto. Now, I know we're not supposed to be negative, but I just want to note that Councillor Chow and I were on council at the same time. Of course, she voted against funding the program. I voted for funding the program. And I think that's an example of a stark difference between the two of us. Um, uh, one of the things I want to mention is that I've also advocated on behalf of young people in schools. Uh, on my way here, I got a phone call from a mother with a biracial child who was facing a suspension. And after this meeting tonight, I'll be on the phone with her, fighting to make sure that he's not suspended from school and that he gets a fair shake from his school board. My campaign is about making Toronto safer, cleaner, and kinder, because we can't have a safe city unless we have a kind city. When city council put hundreds and hundreds of homeless people out on the street, closing the warming centers. They saved a few hundred thousand dollars, but it cost us millions in lost revenue at the TTC. Okay. So you see, that we can't have time. a safer city without a kinder city. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am Mitzi Hunter, daughter of Isaac and Yvonne Hunter, granddaughter of Eva and Alan Hunter. I came to Canada with my grandmother when I was three years old from Jamaica. My family came to this country so that my brothers and I could have a better life. And you know, that, that vision and that dream that they have was largely fulfilled with my brothers and I. But I know that from talking to young people in this city, that they don't feel like they have that same opportunity and that same potential. You know, I talked to my niece, Jada. I'd asked her, if, you know, are you going to buy a house one day? She said no. She doesn't think she can afford it. And that's not the Toronto that we want. That's not the city that we want to see. You know, for many years now, we see that very slow decline in our city. We see more homelessness on our streets. And, you know, we have to take action. We have to do something about that. And we can't just keep doing things in the same old way that we have been in the past. We have to prepare our city for the future, for the future that we want, a city where everyone feels like they belong in our city, that they're included in our city. I know what that feels like. 
I grew up in Scarborough. I'm from Scarborough. And people who are on that outside want inside. You know, I look at the issues that we face, whether it's gun violence or whether it's the affordability, and I say we have to take action. We have to do things to make things better in our city for everyone. I'm running to be mayor of Toronto. So we have a city that works for everyone everywhere in the city. I want to fix the six, fix transit, fix housing, fix the services, and make sure that everyone feels that they are belonging and that they are included in our city. But I can't do it without you. I need your help and your support. This is a historic election. Make no mistake, your vote and your voice matters. Thank you. I've been at this for the community since 1993. At the age of 19 years old, I opened up my own recording studio. From there, I was exposed to a lot of injustices that were happening in schools, in the criminal justice system, and in education. And I made a vow at that point to assist the students that were coming to my studio to do work. By 1996, I had volunteered on a provincial campaign, and I realized that public service is not something that's out of reach for the average person. So in 1997, at the age of 23, I put my name up for Scarborough Rouge River, which was Scarborough Malvern at the time, and ran in the amalgamated uh, elections in 1997. My goal was to bridge the gap between people and government, and that still is my goal today. After I ran in 1997, I realized good ideas did not win elections. It was volunteers and finances. So I took a break and I, I came back into the ring in 2010. In 2010, at the same time, I started as a legal assistant. I started my first stint at university because I didn't uh, go to university at, when I finished high school. And I was um, for campaign. I put myself up for a 2010 municipal election again. So from that time forward, at the age of 36, I entered law school. And my vision at that point, after helping the recording arts community for so long, I realized it was a revolving door. I was trying to keep people away from violence, and it was successful. But what ended up happening, it was a reoccurring cycle. I became a lawyer and I've been fighting against injustice in the city. Um, one of the lead advocates against carding with a lot of other community advocates and lawyers. And I stand here today because I find this city needs a representative who can relate to all people, all walks of life, who has the experience in arts and academia and the criminal justice system. And I vow to do my best for the city of Toronto, for all races, all religions, to make sure we get the benefits that we deserve from City Hall. Thank you. Thank you. thank you so much to the organizers that have put this together, and thank you to everyone that, that is here. This is refreshing because this would not have been present 20, 30 years ago. Most people know me as chief of police or former chief of police, but they don't know me. They just know of me. Nobody understood the journey that was taken to get here with my parents who came from Jamaica with six kids hoping for a better education in hopes that we create opportunities for better opportunities for success, whether it be a job or having a small business or anything. What I've learned from knocking on doors year after year, talking to people, is that this city is a city of immigrants. It is a city of people that have come here who've tried to stay here but need the proper resources to help them out. City Hall has disconnected from all of the communities. Most of the decision making that has been made all of the money tends to go downtown, but does not go into all of the communities. It's important to have these meetings because it's dealing directly with people, people that are struggling, people that need help. It is not a one-size-fits-all, but City Hall tends to do that all the time. When I've worked for my 38 years, going right across the city, in each and every neighborhood, having the opportunities of talking to families and talking with mothers, listening to what their concerns and needs are, whether it's not having enough food or not having the security in the neighborhoods that they are living in, they are not given the fair opportunity that others have. My role is to get to the decision-making table. When we can get to the decision-making table, better discussions are going to be had at City Hall, and those discussions are going to involve everybody, not just special interest groups, but everybody. And then that way, when we start dealing with solutions, they will include your voice and your lens as well so that we can have a healthy, vibrant city where everybody is involved and others like us can have more opportunities of being at City Hall and being at that decision-making table. So thank you very much thank for the you. opportunity this evening. You, as, as mayor of the city, are you going to accept that status quo? 
where the quality of your life depends on which postal code you live in? Or are you going to do about something about it? And if you're going to do something about it, what would it look like? Benefit from our city. We should not live in fear depending on our postal code. This status quo is unacceptable. And I'd like to know, as mayor of the city of Toronto, what would you do to close that gap that will have meaningful difference, not only for some people, but for all? Thank you. Thank you. And the first candidate will have to take that question is Celine. We immediately go to policing, and we know that there is over-policing, and we're more likely to be arrested, we're more likely to be charged, we're more likely to be hit. And the Auditor General, in his, in, as mayor, what I would do is, again, a, a multifaceted prong approach, approach where it looks to upscale and expand programs like the Indigenous-led pilot program that redirects policing calls to community-based programs like yours, the Zero Gun Violence Program. And when we support programs like this, if you look at research from the University of Washington, it shows that there's an 11 to 1 return on investment. So every dollar that we put into programs like zero... The type of skill sets that we want in our police to, mat to match the new makeup of our community. Thank you. That is our time. Thank Sorry. you. Next candidate will be Mitzi Hunter. Thank you alongside you, and I know that this is, um, this is something that we have to end in our society, and we have to, you know, get rid of gun violence. You know, in my community in Scarborough Guildwood in the last year, we shot each other on, on the school grounds, and, you know, two, two young men died. And, you know, when I talk to the principal and the, the school leaders, what they ask me for are more... Mitzi Hunter? So... So this is um, just, I was just driving through Little Jamaica uh, over the weekend, and it really is a shadow of what it used to be in terms of the vibrancy on Eglinton Avenue. And, you know, as a city, I believe that we have to take responsibility for that. When we do infrastructure programs that are large-scale, multi-year, you know, we have to think about the small businesses along that corridor and how we ensure that this is, does not gentrify them away out of the community and ruins the character that really made that a vibrant space. And so that is something that I believe that we have to correct. Uh, we have to restore that. And I know that many organizations like the BBPA are doing a great job and others in the area to animate the space and to bring people back. The city has to be a very strong partner in that initiative and make sure that those small businesses can survive and thrive and continue to be a unique part of that community and that space. We have other corridors as well that, um, that are having the same challenges. We look at the Golden Mile community, that's you know major, major um, transformation that will occur there. In the design of the secondary planning, we have to build in that small business, micro business, and not take away the character of these communities when we do these, uh, these infrastructure programs. And they're gonna be happening all over the city. Um, and this is something that I, I really believe in. I really believe that it is important that we bring those local businesses back. And the investments that are going to be made, there has to be investments in their survival as well. And that could be in the form of marketing, and promotion. It could be in the form of um, below market rents. Uh, for my Toronto Affordable Housing Corporation, I will have retail space available in those um, housing units that are built on the city-owned lands. The city will be the, the builder and the owner at, of those lands, and, um, and we can make space available for those small businesses at that is our below time. average Thank market you. so that they have a space to survive and to continue to... Great. And, uh, you know, I, when we first came into Canada, we eventually wound up in a small town called Milton. And Milton did not trust me. We were the only black family in Milton at the time. They had no Jamaican products whatsoever. So I remember on the Saturdays when my mom would drive to Little Jamaica to buy the hard dough bread or the bulla. And I remember my brother having to go up there to get the Afro Sheen blowout kit. It was the only place where you could get this stuff. So understanding the history of it is so key and critical. It defines success to small businesses, and we need that. That is the vibrancy of Toronto. That's what makes Toronto, Toronto. 
if we don't support our small businesses, especially our cultural businesses, Toronto will fail. So you have my guarantee that I will support with everything that I can to make sure that Little Jamaica especially gets revitalized, creating the right incentives, whether it's grants, loans, making sure that the province gets on board for those people that have the ability of making decisions, understands its vibrancy and its importance and its relevancy to our culture. So you have my commitment that we will get it done, and you also have my commitment that it is due, because that LRT, which is supposed to be done years and years and years ago, had critical impact on the state that it is in right now, and there should be some compensation for that. The government caused that, and the government should step, step forward to fix that. Thank you. The next can Thank you. Can you just repeat the question? Because I didn't hear the clarity of the of people. You find illicit activities. The problem is Little Jamaica has been labeled as a troubled spot from the past because of the demographic. Um, what I can tell you about my experience with Little Jamaica is growing up in the east end of Toronto, I didn't know the divisions between east and west and how you weren't supposed to go in certain areas. Um, however, every year, Caravana, um, as a teenager, we're going out. And where do we go? We would travel from the East End, McCowan and Shepherd, all the way to Eglinton West. Just so you can find a nice flashy tracksuit. I got my first gold cap there, 17 years old. Um, and I just, it was amazing to see all the black businesses together. And the benefit of Eglinton West is that if you go for one thing, such I was going for the tracksuit, um, now I get exposed to restaurants, I get exposed to hair salons, I get exposed to record stores. All the different things the black community has to offer, specifically the Jamaican community. And the fact that J the Jamaican community has a heavy influence on Toronto is something that Jamaicans should all be proud for and West Indians as well. Because when I speak to people, they always say, oh, you have a Jamaican accent. I'm like, I'm not Jamaican, I'm Guyanese and Bermudian, but I know because of how we speak here, Jamaica has a huge influence. So to stop illicit activities, it's the same as anywhere. I don't think Little Jamaica has a problem with illicit activities. Our community has a problem with poverty, missed opportunity, and other things like that. But Little Jamaica is the prime place to solve those issues. JD's is one example, a, a, a clothing store. Young man, very successful throughout the early 2000s because he, he started a place where you can buy shoes and fashion from, straight from New York, and everybody flocked there. So what I would say is to stop illicit activities as mayor, I would ensure that black businesses are supported, that the area is promoted, and I would work with Rob Davis, because as the first Canadian chair of Caravana, I would want to bring Kitty's Carnival back to Eglinton West, because that's you. where it belongs. Hey, Scarborough likes it right where it is. It can stay in Scarborough, Scarborough as well. Scarborough likes it right where it is. Come on now, Malvern needs it too. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. The next candidate to take that on will be close. Little Jamaica is a gem that will be lost if we continue to rely on government to give us what is owed to us. It is time for a public inquiry to be launched into one of the longest evictions in our history because that is exactly what happened. You cannot be given millions of dollars and be 10 years behind in your product. And for those reasons, I. I strongly am advocating that a land trust be given to Jamaicans so that little Jamaica is passed down for generation to generation. And I say this because there are churches and charities enjoying 99-year lease agreements. Thurm, at Ontario Place, has received a 95-year lease agreement from Doug Ford. Why can't we get one? As As a child of Jamaicans, we don't beg for our freedom. We will not be begging this time around. We deserve the first right to ownership along the Eglinton line. And we deserve to be able to build above the stations so that we are housed close to home. This is not a negotiation with Doug Ford. He owes it to us to pay back for every square mile that was taken and every person that was shoved out of our home. So that being said, I'm not here to play with Doug Ford. I'm coming to get our trust fund back. Thank you. The next candidate.
wanted to take. <laughs> <laughs> Can't top that, folks. <laughs> Amen to all of that. Yeah. <laughs> Access local jobs, travel less, build the housing, right? So you can stay in the community and support the local economy. You know, I was thinking, I, we're here in uh, um, a construction workers union trade, right? And there's a lot of construction going on there. Why can't the workers eat right now locally? That would help the local, because there are a lot of places that serve a lot of really good food work with the unions so, so that they could, speaking about show, show. We're workers. also the seasonal agricultural workers, so Canada doesn't eat without Jamaica. Yeah. <laughs> Let it be known. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the vacant units that are right now, yeah. they could go to youth programs, health services, arts program. It's vacant right now. Why can't it be used? right now while you're doing the negotiation okay um, so let's get that done yes the secondary plan all of those things are important but at the end of the day it's about power it's about saying that yes we are here we've been evicted you own us uh, or we're not going um, because you know one thing we could do we could stop giving contracts to the companies that are constructing that Edmonton LRT, that is suing us, suing Metrolink, right? We could stop giving contracts to them right now. If they're, if they're taking us to court, why are we continuing to give contracts to them? I think that's one way to get their attention uh, on top of the, uh, the eloquent uh, suggestion from Ms. Brown there. Thank you. <laughs> um, but I'm going to build on her response and talk about the first thing that we need to do is to protect Little Jamaica but through community land trust. So you're absolutely right. Um, community land trust can prevent gentrification and it's the first place to start. The second thing that we need to do is to ease up residential zoning to ensure that people could have mixed use. They could work and live in their residence, in their, in their homes. I started a, a business as an entrepreneur. I didn't have a brick and mortar location. I started it inside so I could save costs. At a time when people are recovering from a pandemic where everybody worked at home before, why can't we have uh, the zoning that looks like that? And this is not just a, a economic issue. This is a, looking at policy through an equity lens to ensure that racialized people, black people, and especially women, the largest growing uh, demographic of entrepreneurs in the North America are black women. So this is a gendered issue. It is a racial issue as well. As well, when we look at commercial corridors like Little Jamaica, when businesses close to rent, to offer renting for housing, et cetera, we destroy the opportunity for that to regain that retail space and if small businesses are the engine of our country it is also the engine of our community so if you destroy that in little jamaica you destroy the microeconomics of that of that area as well also when we think about zoning we're talking about the levers that we have within the city of toronto to use to protect and to preserve this place look at when we're looking at up zoning or to there were three uh, neighborhoods that were piloted for up zoning little jamaica was not one of them they keep being left off the priority list. And it's time that that needs to be reversed so that we, when we're thinking about innovative solutions to housing, to businesses, to making sure that people are thriving during this recovery period of a pandemic, that we're doing it in a way that's fair and equitable, that looks at racial inequality, that looks at gender inequality, and helps our communities really thrive. Thank you. Savannah Junior Carnival Parade on Eglinton Avenue. It was a lynch mob because one of the other politicians in the neighborhood, and I think Velma Morgan from Operation Black Vote was there, organized the community to tell them that we were going to bring criminals in from Detroit. Yeah. Look it up. Google search it. Okay? We went through that battle and we brought Junior Carnival to Eglinton. But we didn't bring Junior Carnival to Eglinton to have a party. We brought Junior Carnival to Eglinton because we wanted the cultural community to benefit from the celebration of its culture in its own backyard. I approached Carabana. I see Winston LaRose giving me a fist pump. Winston LaRose was there. Winston LaRose, Mr. Jane and Finch. 
And I'm getting a little bit uh, emotional or verklempt if you, if you watch the old Saturday Night Live uh, episodes because it's very personal to me. You know, the Randy's Patties, the Spence's, Spence's Bakeries, the, the Raps Restaurants, the JDs of the world, we were all part of it. And what we did was we demonstrated to the greater community that black youth were actually part of the economic solution. Remember, 1994, we were coming out of an economic recession. And because of that parade, black businesses were able to pay their rent, not get evicted because the rent is too damn high then too. It's too damn high now. And we have to look at ways that we support our retail communities in ways that are meaningful to them. And I'm, you know, respectfully, I'm not talking about fairy dust and programs. Our black businesses are resilient if given half the chance. And so I would put it to you this. We have to go back to the days where we depend on ourselves, we celebrate our own culture, and we buy from communities that support our community. And that's what economic independence is. Thank you. That is our time. To Pete Korczynski, Regis's father, this afternoon. Nia, you represented this family, and three years on, they are still asking you for documents related to Regis's case as they continue to fight for her. Documents that you have claimed you don't have, documents which you have denied to give this family. And I am here to ask you this evening if you will finally, first of all, transfer over the documents that you have from when you were a lawyer for this family back to the woman sitting over there, and if you will account for the large sums of money that you took from this family while doing your so-called legal work, because a lot of us know you in this room and saw you on TV after that incident. And I think you need to account for how you got up on that stage. Mr. Desmond Cole, it's disappointing that you would tell lies in front of this audience. She's right there. That's, that's, that's fine, that's fine. Mr. Desmond Cole, I represented that family wholeheartedly to the best of my ability. And unfortunately, they chose to, to change their representation. I've given them four books, twice, with all the information that I've collected. Even somebody came to my office while I was helping another family and demanded one of the books when I told them it would be ready the next day. No, I'm speaking to you because you raised that question. Ms. Beals and I had a very good relationship, okay? And you can laugh all you want because you weren't there, Desmond. I asked you for help and you did not, you refused to help that family when I asked you, okay? Claudette knows. Sorry, Madam, uh, I, Madam no, Chair, no, no, can we? Hold on, hold on. This it's okay, is, This no, has nothing to do with the residents of the city of Toronto. This is a private, no, this is a private matter. Respectfully, this is a private matter. This is not a public matter. And I would respectfully ask Mr. Cole and anybody else who might have a grievance against Mr. Singh to take it up with him privately and not use the time of the people in this room for your crusading. So we, we have, have real one problems final to solve question. in the city of Toronto. Thank you so much. We've got one just, final question, and we're going to ask to Selena, who was unable to answer, if that's okay. I just, I just want to finish. Seconds. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. I represent this city at a very disadvantage to myself. I, I hardly take payment from people, okay? I helped the family the best I could and was paid a certain point after. Now, I can't get into details because that's confidential between solicitor and client. But you can look around this room and you can ask anybody I've represented and they will tell you, I, I, you can. I represent people to the best of my ability most of the time without taking pay. That is our so time. So it's false what Desmond's saying and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Selena. We haven't asked you a question yet and we want to give you the opportunity. So, uh, you know, you get a younger person. That's great. So just, just to, so thank you very much for having me tonight. I am so grateful to be here because a lot of you may not have realized that you've helped raise me throughout the 30 years that I've been on, 32 years that I've been on this earth. We come from a very small community and we have survived in spite of every effort to wipe us off out of our neighborhoods. So I'm asking you to vote for me because this is the investment you made paying itself back. 
and I am here to show you exactly what your time, effort, and blood, sweat, and tears has gone into. It's gone into a generation of young people that are seeking to take care of their parents, a generation of young people that do not want to leave the place that their grandparents put, their grandparents were earning $2 an hour in so that we could earn our living today. I'm asking you to vote for me because you know that the only way forward is if the working class is given back their purchasing power, their independence, their autonomy, and they're empowered to become leaders. Because our biggest problem in Toronto is that there's too many children of executives trying to tell us how to live. We know how to hustle, we know how to build, we are the lifeblood that drives this city forward and it's about damn time we get respect for it. We're not asking anymore and it's time to have a mayor that knows that you are done begging. You deserve, you deserve to have your faith rewarded and it's my job as your leader to coach the entire council to give you the respect that you deserve because they have been lacking a coach they know how to play the game, but they don't know how to coach others to take their places, and we need to be the ones to show them. So vote Chloe Brown from June 18th to the 13th. Check out my website at chloebrown.ca and see the plan that I have to build a trust fund for the working class. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you for allowing me to join with you tonight. Sometime in April, I had an opportunity to listen to black mothers who lost their children to gun violence. They want to build hope in their neighborhoods. And like all of us, they want more social support and better living conditions, better jobs, affordable homes, real investment in the community to stop displacement, increase job opportunities and safety. And even in tough, painful times, the Somali mothers and black mothers held firm to their belief and their saying, if we come together, we can mend the crack in the sky. Yes, we are stronger together. I hope you choose me as your mayor. And together we would build a city that is more caring, more affordable, safer, where everyone belongs. Yes, we can do it. Let's get to it. Let's start now. Thank you. I first want to thank the candidates that are on stage with me. Um, it has truly been an honor to participate in this race with you. It is a race of a lifetime, and it has been an honor to, uh, to share it with you. Um, why am I here? I spent four years in federal politics. I took four years to heal. And coming back at this time in municipal politics is critically important because I saw the devastation that COVID-19 did. And I thought of it juxtaposed against my time in parliament where people said, government moves slow, Selena. We can't repeal mandatory minimums, Selena, because government moves slow. We can't give pardons for cannabis possession because government moves slow. And then a pandemic happened and government moved real fast when it was convenient. And we still got left behind. We still were the ones with the most death and the most hospitalization and the most sickness. We were still the ones that had to beg for the living wage, even though we were called heroes. It is time for a change, but it's change that engages the unusual suspects. It is change that looks to compassion as the root of how we move forward. It is change that sees each other, that sees you, that sees the hurt, that sees the pain, that sees the joy, that sees the conviction of our community. We are better, we deserve better. We've always deserved better. And now is the time where better comes home to roost. Now is the time to elect a mayor that could see you, that could love you, that could be compassionate for you, that could ensure that policies, programs, and implementation of plans considers you first through an equitable lens and not through a corporate lens. Visit Selena for Mayor T.O. to see the plan, but know that everything I do in this race is done out of love and in seeing all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Statement. 
Um, first off, thank you everyone for being here and, and thank you for all of the organizers and everyone running it. And I just want to say thank you. You know, it has been a journey. The fact that I've lived in the city for 40 years, I've raised my family in the city for 40 years, and I care. I care about what's going to be happening with my kids, whether or not they're going to be able to afford a place. But what I bring to the table is the fact that 38 years I have worked in this city and I've been in every single corner. I've dealt with the hardships and I've listened to the mothers with respect to what their issues are and what the concerns are. People aren't voting because government is not connecting with all of the communities. The loudest voice in the room is taking advantage of everybody else. I don't want that to happen. From what I have seen, I want to make that change. I know that I can make that change, and that is exactly why I'm running. If you vote for me on June 26th, I will be in the communities, the communities that have been least served year after year, that have been given window dressing when there is so much more that has been needed in the communities. Understanding the journey that it took for me to get to where I got to was not easy. When everybody does not look like you, you have to fight harder. But I would tell you what makes this city the fantastic city are the people. Didn't matter what corner I went to, there was always somebody that cared, that had compassion, that wanted to make a positive difference. I want to find more of those people in those corners. I want to leverage you to be part of the solution with me, and I will get it done. So thank you so much for taking the opportunity to listen to me, and I hope on June 26, you pick an experienced leader, a person that knows the city, that will work collaboratively with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. As I've stated in my opening. You, from Davis. <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead. Him and Aristotle, no, go ahead. Him, no, no, no. I thought I, I heard my name. That's okay. That, Some, somebody's saying it down No, there. that's okay. That's fair, fair enough. That, you know, next thing you know, people are gonna confuse us. <laughs> Candidates look alike, or so I've been told. All right, I hope that wasn't being broadcast along with my joke about the Italian soccer team earlier, so. Uh, in any event, my name is Rob Davis. I'm running to be the next mayor of Toronto because I want to build a safer, cleaner, and kinder city of Toronto. I'm running because, like many of you, I believe the rent is too damn high. Who agrees with that? Right? I'm running because the traffic is moving too damn slow. I'm running because three candidates who don't look like us didn't bother to show up and give a damn about your opinion. That's why I'm running. Who agrees with that? I'm running because one of our candidates has the good fortune of having a private charity that raises hundreds of thousands of dollars but won't report publicly where they got the money from. So that candidate starts on third base while the rest of us start at the home plate trying to swing at the ball politically. I'm running because it's time that we elect a mayor who looks and sounds like us looks and sounds like us. I'm running because I've spent my life and it's been my life's work to serve people. Whether I was a 26-year-old city councillor candidate running up and down Little Jamaica or whether it was as a school trustee at the Catholic School Board making sure that kids weren't being expelled or suspended for things that weren't their fault. So, if you agree that the rent is too damn high and the traffic is moving damn, too damn slow, then I ask for your vote. And I'm going to represent you with honesty, with clarity, and with vigor. I'm going to tell the truth, I'm going to call people out, and I'm going to make sure that everybody gets the service that they deserve without getting the tax bill that they don't deserve. I'm going to be tough on crime and gentle on taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much to all the organizations that came together to put this on. It's, it is so important. And, uh, and Rob Davis is right. There are three other candidates that ought to have been here tonight, and they're not. And uh, why do they deserve to have your support if they don't show up for you? And, uh, and I think that's important. Uh, I, you know, what is at stake in this election 
is a once in a generational opportunity. I, I truly believe that it is. And we're not gonna have the city that we want with the same faces doing the same thing over and over again. Change is possible. It is time for change. It is long past time. You know, I've spent most of my professional life in service to our community. Most of you in this room, I've walked with you. You know, I look at Medenta when the Somali youth needed a fair chance at education. We had to change those numbers. We had to change the system to support them to succeed. I'm in this race. I've made that sacrifice. I resigned my seat because I believe in our city, in the people. And it is time for that change. We need to fix all the things we talked about. And it is possible that we can do that. Housing, transit, services, all of those things, we can fix it. We have to do it together. And that requires that people have to show up between June 8th and June 13th. It's advanced votes. Get it out of the way so that on June 26th, that you are free and able to help pull the vote because that is what it's going to take. It's going to take all of us working together. So I ask you for your support. I'm number 55 on the ballot, right in the center under Hunter. Let's fix the six together. Let's get it done. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for being here and being patient and, and listening to all of us. Um, this is not the first time, as you know, I've run for a political position. And it's because I strongly believe that there's a huge gap in our society. I'm always working when I'm running, and I'll be honest, I'm a full-time criminal defense lawyer and it's extremely hard and busy. But I don't have the luxury of sitting back and waiting for the opportune time. I run because I know our city needs it. 2018 I ran, Tory was there, that didn't deter me. 22 I ran, Tory was there, did not deter me. What I'm trying to let you know is that I strongly believe in my ability to represent the city because being a mayor is more than just budgets and numbers. It's about being the face, being the person who communicates on behalf of the city. As the most international, uh, multicultural city in the world, we need a leader who can speak to all of those elements. I'm half Indian, as a lot of people don't believe, but uh, I am, right? And I also uh, am very involved in all communities. And if we're gonna have a mayor who cannot relate to the youth who are pulling the trigger, and who cannot relate to the court system, or the entrepreneur, then we don't have a mayor that's well-rounded enough. And I'm letting you know all the major issues in this city I have first-hand experience with. I have a very good friend who developed schizophrenia at 28, and I'm his trustee because he went homeless and I had to make sure he had mental health supports. And this is an indigenous man in this city who could not find a bed. Both my parents were disabled, and I understand what it's like to fight for wheel trans and sit on the phone waiting and waiting for these, you know, to book your schedule your appointment. I was an entrepreneur, first Canadian chair board of Carabana, uh, first, Cana first Canadian born chair of Carabana. So I have experience in all of these avenues, and I'm saying, as a 49-year-old male who raised two children on their own, who's in the criminal justice system, I'm asking for your support. The media has not mentioned my name very often, unfortunately, but so it hasn't mentioned Rob Davis's name either, and he's very experienced. So we're relying on you as the voters to really search your soul and your heart to say who's going to represent this city the best, who can touch all angles of society and do a good job at it. So I ask you to visit my website, Elect Nia Singh, that's E-L-E-C-T-K-N-I-A-S-I-N-G-H, and support me. Support my team, support us, because if you help me, I can help you. Thank you. Thank you.